the next level. Yeah. Let me ask, how many in here have the experience okay. of growing up or living with steps on the front of their house, a stoop or a porch by a show of hands? Okay. If I were to ask where your first kiss was, if I were to ask where you sat when you were frustrated, angry, mad with your mom, where you thought, porch, as we all know, was the social port portion of the house that you didn't have to have people in, but they could still be there. What we've done, and I can see people shaking their heads, and that's a nice thing, because the porch goes back in this country to slaves coming from Africa. They were the first ones, historically, to build porches. We had the author of The American Porch with us on Saturday when we first launched the porch. And he had done the research and validated that. The porch went away when we got air conditioning, suburbs, and cars. But it's coming back. And the reasons that it's coming back are directly related to desire for community. I'm originally from Philadelphia, and I can tell you that the first time I ever heard of anyone having a babysitter was when I left Philadelphia and no longer was a part of my extended family where I could just be left or your children could be left with other relatives. And we were in a multi-generational household. What we've done here, we have the porch. The porch is fabulous. Anyone that was at the art exhibit could see it. If anyone would like, I don't, I'm not going to lecture the whole time, I promise. But anyone that saw the porch, would you like to take a few words to describe what you saw, what you thought? If anyone that is here saw it? No one here was here? It's a, okay. Well, first of all, on the front of your porch, you always had steps, or you usually had steps. She would be too young to sit on the porch. She'd have to sit on the steps. The old people, the wise ones, sat on the porch. There was probably a dog under the porch. They were not allowed in houses. There was a dog. And you had just a couple of things. We're trying with this set to actually replicate so that as we're talking and as you're visualizing what we've done, you can see the porch. Why even was it important, we felt, from a particular focus of creative aging, to come up with the idea of a porch? You can, you, come on in. Where are you doing fine? Sure. Well, for the last 10 years, Double Nichols has collected true stories of seniors to celebrate them while they could still hear their applause. And our focus on celebrating seniors were those individuals who had done wonderful things in their lives, but they may not have had a reputation. They may have just reared eight children. They all went off to school somewhere, and no one ever knew them. And they aged in place. And when they aged in place, they looked out windows, they got a little too old to be going out too late at night, so they stayed home. Transportation wasn't necessarily that available to them. But they were there. And all of us busy ones, younger ones, were busy creating lives and making lives and didn't have a whole lot of time to spend with them. Their stories didn't get told. Well, I was at uh, Washington, uh, what was it, GW Hospital. And for some reason, it hit me like a ton of bricks. As I looked all around that area, there were food trucks, there were t-shirt uh, trucks, there were candy trucks, there were ice cream trucks, anything in the world. And I was buying bubble tea. And I said to the vendor, my gosh, you can buy anything out here you want. This is a mall. And he said, well, we just take it to where the people are. What do you think happened next? I said, I'm going to build the porch, and I'm going to take that porch to where those people are. Well, people laughed. They thought maybe that was funny or whatever. But when we built that porch, I wish you could hear the responses. 
beginning with the seniors themselves, the people who, wanted to, who want to talk. They, we collect the stories. We, we've spent, se oh, seven or eight years contractually with the Armed Forces Retirement Home. I have some most wonderful stories of uh, armed, uh, World War II veterans. Mm. We have all sorts of stories. Now what we can do is take that porch to the people that can't come to us. And that's the exciting part, because they truly want to be there. Now, in addition to that, how many of you are from urban areas or relatively new to urban areas? How many are you in cities that are gentrifying? How many of you hear gentrification as sometimes a negative word? <coughs> OK. Well, that's the other part, that we don't try to make statements but we try to recognize that if you don't know who you're talking to, you're not going to want to talk to them. The porch is a neutral place, and we all professionally understand that if you have a neutral place, you can really talk easier, better, clearer. Come on up here and have seats, any of you. There are four seats up here, uh, any of you that would like to sit down. Well, the porch serves another purpose particularly in a city like Washington, D.C., which is highly gentrifying. You can bring that porch into a neighborhood where the people have lived there for 45 and 50 years, and they know where the food will grow well. They know what place you don't want to go to because it doesn't do anything right. They also know what is the history of that neighborhood from three, four generations. No one ever asked them. No one ever asks them. And the new people coming in, they don't know these people, and they have all these ideas, and they want to lay them out there. What happens? They think that the ones that are there don't know anything, and the ones that are there don't like them coming in, changing everything. What the porch allows is for us to go in to a neighborhood and rock, and sit and invite someone who's been there 40 years to come and tell us what it was like when. And it's not just that simple, but they love to talk about them. They're proud of where they are. It's not about the poverty or anything else. It's about their pride of place, their culture. And it's easy that way for someone who's new to listen because they're not intruding, they're not taking away, they are adding to. And if you listen and you add to a person, you are more inclined to give to them as well. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure that out, nor a PhD, neither of which. It's, it's common sense, and it's, how, it's when we didn't wait, we didn't schedule phone mess calls. You know, it was talking, it was conversing. That's what the porch is allowing us to do, and to collect the stories. We also video the stories, creating digital library with the stories. So there's a history because they're gone in smoke if all you do is chat about them. Now, while you're sitting in this room, and I thank you for your attention, I want you to also know that we're being live streamed from Emerson College in Massachusetts. And we're going around the world with this session here. We may get questions to come in from someplace, and we'll answer them. You are welcome to ask questions or to add to the conversation, and at this point, what I'd like to do is just try and give you a sense of why and who are these ladies that are sitting here so beautifully, allowing me to just chatter on. <laughs> on my far left, I have my mentor, one of my mentors, this beautiful lady in green. I'll let her tell you herself who she is. I don't have to talk for her. That's the first thing we have to learn. People can talk for themselves. They know who they are. And why don't we do that? Please introduce yourself as broadly as you can, because if you leave anything out, I'm going to tell it. <laughs> well, before I introduce myself, I would like to acknowledge someone in the audience. And I know she has a lot of poor stories. And that's Dr. Sandra Crew, who is the dean of the School of Social Work at Howard University. And I'm Bernice Catherine Hopper. And I come from a family of 12 in the foothills of Virginia. So with 12 people, 
you know we had a lot going on in the family. On the porch. <laughs> on the porch. <laughs> and I remember one time on the porch that I was waiting for the postman to arrive. I had saved my money and had ordered some maple syrup candy from Vermont, Virginia. <laughs> I couldn't wait for the uh, postman to come. And when he arrived, I got my package and I was planning to just enjoy my candy because I had worked for the money and I needed to have an opportunity to enjoy my candy. Mama came out and said we had to share it with everybody. <laughs> So I just really got a taste of the candy. But the porch served as a place of socialization for us. And it was a wonderful experience as I think back over the porch situation. And we had Concord grapes behind our porch. And you know at this time of the year is when the Concord grapes become uh, blue and everything. So we also used to use our opportunities to eat the grapes. So our porch was not only a place for socialization, it was a place where you ate and you played and you talked and you shared. And what Dr. Harper did not tell you is that Dr. Bernice Harper is 94 years young. Yay. And the, the significance of that for us is with pride, the degree of health, the vitality, the name of this is creative aging. You age well when you do well, I think. And I only say that, I say that with pride. She looks at me every time I say it. <laughs> but I'm proud of it because she also takes the Metro every day and goes and runs a foundation that she started. <laughs> so you take all that and you put it together and you say, how, how come, why? She's not sitting at home texting. <laughs> and also beside Dr. Harper is a totally, these ladies represent for me something that my grandmother used to always say. And that was always have friends 10 years younger and 10 years older. And I used to wonder, why would I want to run around with a five-year-old? <laughs> she would say, there'll only be five for a year. Just keep doing it. And with time, that spreads. And I want to introduce you to the other side of me, who I call my mini-me. <laughs> introduce yourself and talk a bit. OK, well, my name is Robin Campbell, and I am the five-year-old here, <laughs> whereas um, I am an import, just like she was saying, I am not, I am new to the city and um, new, kind of part of the gentrification, if you would say. Um, I'm originally from Portsmouth, Virginia, so the Hampton Road area. So when I think about porches um, being introspective, uh, how my family developed, and how I came to know and stories I share with Miss Tony is I was raised um, by a single father. So it was three girls and a single father. And I like to say we were the originals, daddy's little girls. And just our um, journey from staying with my grandmother who often had who had a porch at our family home and moving when my dad got remarried to when we didn't have a porch and now living in our own family home and just seeing the changes and the stories that come from that porch. And um, one of the stories I can think about is that when we were in that transition, it was about 10 of us in one house. And like she was saying, you, but you had that multi-generational thing where my dad was working from three to three every day and my <coughs> grams would be running errands. And the rule was, if no one is home, you can't be outside, not even on the porch. So that year, somehow we all got scooters for Christmas. And again, the rule was, you know, don't be outside if no one is at home. So the Three Musketeers was like, well, if they don't see us outside, then how will they know that we're outside? So what started as taking those scooters and only scooting around the porch went from down from the porch to the sidewalk to up and down the driveway. So in 30 minutes, we were up and down the street. So we're just scooting our lives away. And then we see that white Cadillac coming down the street and we all immediately look at each other and try to scoop <laughs> back to safety so that, you know, we couldn't be seen. But I don't even remember which one of us was, but we weren't supposed to be out there. And one of them tripped over the porch and <laughs> she came up and we got sent to bed without dinner that night. But it's just one of the stories you even think of mm -hmm. or even now how I go back to visit my grandmother. Just how when I leave her home and I tell her goodbye, it never ends, you know, with me just leaving out the house. She comes out and stands on that porch and watches me until I am no longer in sight. So it just reminds me of family. And I'm so glad to know Miss Tony and be a part of this project. 
Well, thank you. I'll tell you one briefly because I laugh. Um, anyone that has spent any time with me would probably say that they understand how this would be a true story. Uh, my mother was quite, quite young. And in fact, it was really probably my grandmother that reared both me and my mom. Well, we did all live together. And at about five years old, my mother brought home, because I was getting ready to go to school, I think, brought home a hat. It was ugly green, felt with what I call the turkey feather, flaps on the ears and this thing that pushed up under your chin and it turned up like that. She plopped that on my head, scooted it up and said, oh, you look so cute. I looked in the mirror and thought she had lost her mind. <laughs> well, what do you do when your mother does that? You keep it on. <laughs> well, I went off to school and the little kids down the street were taking me to school. As soon as I got around the corner, I snatched that thing off my head and I wouldn't wear it. When I came home, I had to put it back on. But what I did, I scrunched it up, I just beat it up, broke down that feather, stuffed it in the, in the closet, and thought that that would be a way of not having to wear it again. Well, my mother, she recognized what I had done. She said, you're gonna wear it just like it is. <laughs> <laughs> I put that on my head. Well, being young and also being somewhat spoiled, I cried, I don't want to wear it, and we are arguing, we are arguing, and my grandmother comes, what in the world is going on? She's going to make me wear that, and my mother, I bought that half a school. My grandmother, always the diplomat. Now, Rosemary, that's my mother, Rosemary, did you ask Tony if she liked the hat? Well, I don't have to ask her if she liked it, I bought it. <laughs> Well, she might have an opinion. Oh my God, I had a new word. <laughs> I said, I have an opinion. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> well, I don't remember if it was that day that I no longer had to wear that ugly hat. But what I do remember was that from then on, I had an opinion. <laughs> and I think that on, it's not so much a porch story, but it's a multi-generational story that comes off the porch. I can see so many heads shaking. I know somebody snapped peas on the porch. Somebody else had that light go out because they got home too late and they had to go in with the light out. <laughs> Tell me, share with us some of the stories because this is, this to me is a session where we want to encourage people, particularly if we're all fortunate, we're all going to age far longer than we are today. And as we age, we creatively will call on all the experiences that we've had through life to help us manage that process. And when we do that, it won't be because someone has designed the perfect way to age. It will be because you came up with an opinion of what it meant for you to age for you. And we are usually the last ones that are asked. People design programs and projects, etc. And this is what the seniors need. And this is what the agents need. That ain't so. We know what we need. We ought to be the first ones asked for our opinion. So what I'm asking is share with us, or we can continue to share with you, your opinions about the porch, the project, how you see it, what you think of what we're saying, what else you want to know about what and how we do, because we create programs. That is, we take these true stories and then we, we create productions. And we've performed at the Kennedy Center, Woolly Mammoth Theater, uh, the Atlas Theater. Uh, we've done that. And this coming out on the porch, we're going to do the same thing, obviously, with fewer people. Please, sir. Well, I think this is so timely because when the, the museum opened this weekend. They had a porch. And I had gone by it, and I saw this big overhang thing. I said, well, that looks like a porch. I just thought that to, to myself. And then when Obama was on television, and I said, it really looks like a porch. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that there was a special African-American significance to the, I just thought, everybody has a porch. I had a porch growing up. Everybody. I guess everybody had a porch. Mm -hmm. But someone told me, and maybe you can speak to this, 
that is actually an African concept. Yes. That porches. Oh, she said it. And yes. I didn't know that because yes. they needed to cool themselves and they needed the shade and they needed an outside place of family community. I just think this is excitingly wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Slide over more to the center stage. They can't see me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that better? Okay, thank you. You're absolutely on target because um, Michael, uh, Michael, his name is Michael Dolan, is the author of the book, The American Porch. And his research carried out that there was no word in European languages for porch. There were atria, there were veranda, etc., but no porch. And when the slaves came here, you know who built their houses? So they, held, they built them the same way they built them in Africa. And they built the porch on the front of the house because animals and everything else were behind the house. And this was an extension of their living area. It was the external part of the house. And as um, the country grew and the relationships metastasized, who built the houses? Who put the porches on the houses? When you get to places like uh, our oldest cities, Philadelphia uh, and other places, and they were built, they were built row houses and you had the five steps up with the vestibule and that's where you played jacks or stone jacks or dumb school. Anybody know dumb school? Good, okay. No one here played dumb school? Well, these were, th <laughs> these were the types of games and these were the things you did. It was the socialization place. Uh, let me digress just a second and say that recently I went to Baltimore to visit a friend who had moved into uh, one of the areas of Baltimore that's really going through changes. And they had taken their row house and put this beautiful plant outside and a little fence around it and it was all blocked off. I said, well, it looks kind of nice, but why did you do that? I am tired of my neighbors coming over here and sitting on my steps. <laughs> and I laughed because I said, the sun changes in the afternoon, and that's what neighbors do. They cross the street to sit on your steps when the sun goes down, and in the morning it's the other way. That's how we got to know each other. So those are the types of things when you go into neighborhoods, if you don't ask and you don't know to ask, we never know and we lose so much. And it could be such a positive way to get to know your neighbors. Please add, don't, don't, you're beautiful, but you don't, you know, I, I just let me talk and I love that, but no. go right ahead. Again, I was talking about how um, I had a unique perspective where um, I, when I was small and my parents were still together, we grew up in a nice house with a big porch. So we did, we played with the kids and um, I think we were having a conversation when the porch opened about how, you know, I mean, I'm not that old, but when I was young, I wasn't, you know, we played video games, but we also played outside as well. You know, we went over to our neighbor's house and played with our friends until it was, the lights came on, and you had to be on the porch. And even then, you still didn't want to leave your friends because you were playing on the porch until it was time for bed or school, homework or whatever. And just, you know, go again for my transition to moving in with my grandmother and 10 people in one home and one bathroom, but we also had a porch and just doing things out there and then transitioning to an apartment we stayed in when my dad got remarried and having no porch, but still having that community and keeping with each other. And then into the home we live in now, having a porch and just having people over and remaining in that family, you know, that sense of family and that village it takes. And uh, I just, you know, again, I speak to being a part of this project where again, I'm young, I'm 25 years young. And um, how I met Miss Tony and how I stay in, you know, connection with her, it's an intergener it just speaks to, you know, the intergenerational conversation. Um, I was invited with a friend, a guy friend, to her home for a party that she has every year. It's a um, New Year's party, but not, it's on, what is it, Miss Tony? It's uh, the- uh, December 30th. December 30th, so it's a New Year's Eve Eve party. Mm -hmm. And so I go with my friend, it's me, um, two of us, my guy friend and a girlfriend, and we go there and you know we had to work the next day, so he's like, uh, y'all ready to go? I have to wake up early, this and that. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. So we go and sit on the um, couch waiting for him 
because he's ready to leave supposedly, but he goes and makes his rounds and he's talking and he has us just sitting there waiting. And so Miss Tony comes by and probably sees the annoyance on our face and says, why everyone in my party is supposed to be happy. What are y'all doing sitting here? What's going on? So we explain to her and before we can even finish, she's off to swoop him up and bring him over and says, you never, you don't, you don't keep women waiting. And no sooner than he said that, me and my friends are looking at each other like, and then look at him and the look on his face is just, because he's heard that many times before, but just even how that instance, we all gathered into the front living room and started having that intergenerational conversation just about, you know, expecting things from men and women, how we interact with each other now as a millennial, and if there are any other millennials in the room, just speaking to how it is dating now versus how it was dating then. And just, you know, I began again, I'm very proud of it, but, I started again talking about, you know, well, I was raised by a single father and he raised three girls and I expect this from a man. And, you know, she stopped me missing. It was like, I don't know who you are, but you're going to be all right. And just, <laughs> and just from that conversation, uh, intergenerational friendship growing. So now it's like when she asked me to do something, I know to say I, there is no no. I just say yes, because I know there's more benefit for me and learning, knowing that I can draw so much from having now a 94 year old friend, like what do I have to lose as a young person and holding on to that when God forbid they are no longer here, I keep that and it is my, you know, obligation to make sure the community still have what they left behind, so. You know another? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> another important aspect of the porch is when there's a funeral. The people gathered on that porch. And I'm going to share with you what happened when my sister Ruth died and her son came from California and he said to me, Aunt Bernice, um, I'm supposed to be brave. And I said, I know. He said, I'm not supposed to cry. And I said, yes, you, you are. If God didn't want you to cry, he would not have given you tears. So just put your head on my shoulder and cry as much as you want to. But the other thing was that he had tried to get my uh, oldest sister to let him sing at the funeral. And she said, no, you're not gonna sing. Nobody wants you to sing, and nobody asked you to sing. <laughs> so he went to the minister and told the minister he had written this poem for his mother and that he wanted to sing. And the, and the minister said, okay, you can sing. But Virgil didn't know anything about this conspiracy behind her back. So we all gathered on the porch and left and went to the church and we went down to the, uh, the First Baptist Church, and we're all on the sidewalk, ready to go in, and people are sitting on their porches seeing this funeral procession come by. So then the uh, director of the funeral home came out and gave off the programs, and Happy, we called him Happy. Happy's name was nowhere on the program. And he had a stroke practically. And he said, if I can't sing, there's not gonna be a funeral. <laughs> it's my mama. So I'm looking on seeing how my family members are going to deal with this. I'm supposed to be the expert from out of town. But if you're from out of town, you don't have anything to say. Because you haven't been there and you don't know anything about this. And you went off and got yourself educated and you're not going to be able to tell the family anything. <laughs> so then the time is coming for the funeral to start. And uh, the funeral director went in and told Reverend Robinson that there's not going to be any funeral because Happy says there's not going to be any unless he can sing. So he came out of the church in his long white robe and came out on the sidewalk. And there was a no saying or saying. Virgil was firm, no singing. He, Happy was firm, there was going to be singing. So the minister said, well, let's just go in the church and, and bury Mrs. Ruth right white. <laughs> and so uh, Virgil was all tense and everything and looking angry and hostile. And she expected you to go to a funeral, a wedding, wear a hat, be seen and not heard. So anyway, the just before the eulogy, the minister said, Happy, come up and sing and play. I thought Virgil was going to die right there in the church. <laughs> <laughs> so he went up and sang his heart out to his mother, and Virgil gradually relaxed. And she said, I don't know why they let him sing. I just listened. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the, the family, the family stories, they, they resonate after a fact. And there's always humor. That's the other wonderful thing about stories. I'll share one on, along the same line. In my family, I'm originally from Philadelphia. 
And in fact, I didn't know I had relatives anywhere else outside of Philadelphia. We'd been there so long. And I grew up knowing back to my great, great, great grandparents on both sides and great, great grandparents on one side. So when there was a funeral in Philadelphia of anyone named Mathis, or if not just a funeral, if you knew anyone named Mathis, we were taught, don't date them. Don't worry about anything, you're probably related to them, regardless of <laughs> how it comes about. So that meant that when, a few, and we live forever, it seemed like. All these elders dying, no, thank God, no children or whatever. But anyway, one of the things that I recall was there was someone in our family, an aunt, a great aunt, a great great aunt died. And one of my favorite aunts, that is, she's only about four or five years older than me. We're hanging out together. And we said, oh, I think we were going on a date or trying to go out or something. We said, we got to go to so-and-so's funeral. <sighs> when you come from a big family, you, you don't always, you aren't always respectful. Well, let's go on and do that so we can get on out of here. Well, in Philadelphia, Baker's Funeral Home, they had about five or six different uh, layout rooms in the same place. Auntie Jay and I, we go, we go into the layout room and we put on the appropriate face <laughs> and we sit there and we listen. And they say, and for one final viewing, would you take your turn and come around? We get up, you know the end of the story, I can tell. <laughs> we go up, we look in the casket, we look at each other, so we in the wrong funeral. <laughs> True story, we're in the wrong place. Aunt so-and-so was in another place. But these are the things that families remember. They shape who and what and how you are and how you respond to things. And they're wonderful ways of connecting with other people in many respects because it's real, it's relaxed. Please. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Harper, uh, particularly for your work with grief and loss. Yes. I appreciate that. I'll share a story about Please. my mother um, and the porch. My mother has uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, during the early stages of her Alzheimer's, when we tried to have a caregiver come in and to assist her, uh, mother, uh, in the uh, middle of the winter, put the caregiver out. Mm -hmm. And the caregiver calls me, mm -hmm. and she's calling me from the porch saying that your mother put me out, told me I needed to go home and clean my own house because I didn't need any help. So I called my mother and I said, Mom, um, the caregiver told me that you put her outside. She said, I did no such thing. I put her on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> so that her people could drive by and see her and take her home. <laughs> so, you know, so that was the value of the porch. She didn't see it as outside. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the porch was sort of an extension of the home. But yes. also, it, in her mind, is that she had not done that horrible thing I was accusing her. I have, she had placed her in a safe place mm -hmm. on the porch so she could be seen. <laughs> please let me share if you want to share other stories we can please go right I ahead a story. I just have a, a question and yes. a thought. so I'm from Orlando, Florida a very urban area and we're a very large community arts organization and of course diversity and inclusiveness and all of that is extremely important to us and I love this idea I missed the first few minutes so maybe you covered I love this idea because it does create a safe place for people that walk from different backgrounds almost be forced in a safe way to sit together and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking age here, but in looking at diversity, especially in a place like DC, sexual orientation, uh, absolutely, backgrounds. Absolutely. Have you been able to be intentional about that in this project? We are, we are intentional, particularly with the focus on gentrification, because when we say gentrification, we're usually talking about people of a different culture, not necessarily one that we know, people of a different culture moving into an area that has been populated for generations mm -hmm. by another culture. And those two cultures, let's face it, when we think of different people, we don't necessarily know them. We may know one or two, but that doesn't mean you know them. If they're gonna be your neighbors for real, 
it's, a, it's an investment. And that investment is worth the time. And it also allowed, I, 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 this digression for a moment, up on 14th and P, or 14th and Church, there's a woman, a friend of mine, who said that she has been living there for like five or six years, and she just happens to be the type of person that engages people. She said there's an elderly gentleman, he's African American, that he told her one day, you know, you're the first and only new person that ever takes time to talk to me, and I like it. So more of those, and that, I mean, we don't have to have a sweeping government program, because most things are what you start and what you do yourself. Yes, sir. So when you take this and you go into a neighborhood and you talk about being intentional about it mm -hmm. and trying to bridge that gap, how long do you stay in the neighborhood? Is it, is it over a course of days or a month or what, what? Talk a little bit more about that. Sure. We have about five minutes they're telling me, but I'm going to go until they make me stop, okay? <laughs> I'll sit here and listen until you stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We don't have a set time. That is, we don't say we'll have a day or three days or whatever. But for example, uh, not with the porch. We will do the same thing with the porch, but the porch is new. This is a new effort for us. At the Armed Forces Retirement Home, we form relationships with places, not just individuals. And at the Armed Forces Retirement Home, we went there every Saturday for seven years. I got tired of going. Yeah. And when I say I got tired of going, it wasn't the stories or anything, but I said, you guys love this so much, you can do it. And we taught them how to do it. And what happens is you become a part of their culture, their home. And therefore, it's not about the time, it's about the listening. And if you show you're willing to sh share yourself or some of yourself, it becomes much easier to get people to engage. I'll give you one final example, and that is one of the reasons I started at the uh, Armed Forces Retirement Home so many years ago was that my own father, who was 33 years military, he lived with me for about 10 years, and he said, told me one day, he said, listen, um, I think you better move me into the home, the Armed Forces Retirement Home, while I'm still sane. These are his words. What are you talking about? Well, you know, when I get old, now at this point he's about 83. When I get old, uh, I don't want you flipping me, and I know you don't want to flip me, and I have to be well to go in there. I was a little bit crushed, but the man was so, I mean, it was so, made so much sense. Well, we go, he gets a place, and daddy's girl. I go to see him about every other day. And one day he, when I get up there, he takes me to lunch and he says, listen, uh, you know, you don't have to come so often. Um, you know, the ladies up here, they don't know who you, are, who you are. And they, you know, my father was quite active. <laughs> so, so, my feelings were hurt, but I knew darn well I was not going to not see my dad. So I went to the librarian to volunteer, and I brought double nickels up there to collect stories of veterans. And some of the things that I learned were absolutely incredible. One for me was, it, it just made chills go up and down my spine. We're talking to these guys, and they start talking about the Red Ball Express. Well, I remembered a movie with Jeff Chandler, the Red Ball Express, but what I found out was that a grandfather that I had that had been killed in the war by being run over by a truck. And I always thought, who goes to war and gets hit by a car, you know? The Red Ball Express traveled only about 40 or 50 days, but it was primarily, in fact, totally black soldiers. And they fixed that car, those trucks, on the move, in the dark, without light. And my grandfather was one of those, as was my father. And I never knew that, I never knew any. So you pick up pieces of history, respect for people you didn't know, things that were never told to you, because let's face it, our families still hide things from us too. But am, am I, I have to go off now. This is, this is exciting. You can see we don't really give up easily or anything. <laughs> I want to tell you how much I really appreciate your attention, your, your patience. And if there's anything else that you need to ask, to suggest, 
Uh, we probably have back there on the table information or place where you can do a survey. Anything, please, Robin, Dr. Harper, anything you want to add before we have to bring this to, a, not a close, well, we just have to close this time because we're here locally and we want to see and hear from you and maybe work with you too. I would like to comment, this is a very interesting, diverse group. You can see it from sitting up here. And it's so important that diversity continue to move forward as we talk about racism, spirituality, and those kinds of issues. And this is a wonderful example and a wonderful audience. It is. Thank you all very much to Robin. Oh. No, um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming out, and um, I'm glad to see a lot of younger people as well. So, um, you know, we are the future, but at the same time, like I said, um, we have so much to pull from them before that we have an obligation to carry for. So I hope to continue to do that. Thank you for coming. And I'm just doing what I love to do, and thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you.